Awesome. Always, always know that it's time to go when you hear the recording in progress. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <Hey. laughs> Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Akshay Iyer, and I'm part of the advisory team here at Sarwa. Very, very excited about today's session uh, because today we're hosting Frank Downing from ARK Invest. Uh, Frank, thank you for joining us today from the US. We're really excited to have you with us today. Yeah, thank you. Super excited to be here. Awesome. So Frank is the director of research at ARK Invest. Uh, ARK Invest is a firm that's renowned for its focus on disruptive innovation. Um, you know, they've been at the forefront of identifying and investing in a lot of groundbreaking technologies that have, you know, the potential to revolutionize industries and also transform, um, you know, our world. So today we're going to be diving into a topic that has generated a lot of excitement and anticipation. Um, you've heard all the buzz about it. It's art artificial, artificial intelligence and innovation. So AI, it's often hailed as the driving force behind the next wave of technological advancements. I think from enhancing everyday life with intelligent devices to completely reshaping entire industries, right? The, the potentials for it seems completely limitless. And there's no shortage or hype, um, you know, of hype around AI, especially in the financial markets. And for good reason, they've dominated the year so far and have brought forward, you know, trillion dollar valuations. The convergence with AI, as well as with other innovation platforms, it's really setting the stage for a lot of change. So this session today is going to explore how these technologies intersect and amplify each other. And it's really just creating a future that's very fascinating as well as complex. So Frank's going to be presenting a slide that delves into these innovation platforms uh, and their implications. And following this presentation, we'll move on to a Q&A segment, uh, and then we'll open the floor to your questions in the audience. So just before we get started, a couple of disclaimers here. First one is we don't have a crystal ball. We can't predict the future. So if you came here today for stock picks from Frank or myself, unfortunately, we can't help you. And uh, the second thing is, look, today's discussion shouldn't be interpreted as one-on-one -on -one financial advice. If you do have any particular questions about your own individual circumstances, please feel free to reach out to the SARWA team directly. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Frank from ARC. Uh, Frank, over to you. Awesome. Sounds good. Thanks for that. Um, great introduction. Uh, so I'll share my screen here and pull up uh, uh, the presentation for today. Um, I'm going to walk Perfect. through um, ARC's uh, highlights, let's say, of ARC's big ideas report for 2024. Um, for, for those who aren't familiar with ARC, um, we're a, a U.S.-based asset manager that um, has uh, a variety of strategies centered around disruptive innovation that we distribute um, throughout uh, many regions around the world. Um, we were founded in 2014 by Kathy Wood, um, really with this idea of investing solely in disruptive innovation um, and uh, really taking a, a unique approach uh, that's atypical for uh, buy-side asset managers uh, and really centered around active management. Uh, and doing so in uh, transparent uh, vehicles and being uh, very open about our research. Uh, and that is what we've kind of come to be known for over uh, the 10 years of ARC's history. And, and Big Ideas is a um, uh, kind of the culmination of a lot of that work where our research team is um, looking across the uh, innovation platforms that we base our research on. And I'll show you those five innovation platforms here. Uh, producing um, kind of thought leadership work throughout the year and sharing those insights. Um, we're very active on, on uh, X, formerly Twitter, uh, also on, on various other forms of media. Um, and um, to give you a sense of what we, we mean by an innovation platform, and you see those five here, artificial intelligence, public blockchains, those are the two we'll touch on today, uh, multi-omic sequencing, robotics, and energy storage. Um, we view our um, uh, innovation platforms as uh, foundational technologies that serve as launching pads for innovation uh, that um, really produce uh, exponential growth and oftentimes uh, cut across sectors. So they're general purpose technologies. Uh, so a great example of that is artificial intelligence, which we, we really think is the, the most convergent technology, meaning it, it cuts across all sectors and it really actually accelerates the growth rate uh, of all of these other innovation platforms. And I think you know, the flagship example that we give is the, this kind of convergence between artificial intelligence, 
robotics and energy storage uh, that we believe will power um, autonomous driving and autonomous taxi networks into the future, uh, where you really have this um, dynamic where the car is the robot, the energy storage, uh, the battery in the car is the power source, and the artificial intelligence is the brain. And it's all three of these technologies that are coming together to make that innovation possible. Uh, and another thing that's really important um, when looking at general purpose technologies and doing this research is, is finding technologies that are experiencing uh, a strong cost decline. Uh, how quickly are the costs coming down such that this technology can be uh, made accessible and democratized to the world? Uh, because if the costs of the technology are too high, uh, it, the investment into that field may be ahead of its time. And that's what we believe and we saw a lot of in the tech and telecom bubble, where a lot of money went into things like satellite internet, for example, that uh, the costs were so high, it really was uh, unachievable to, to distribute to the masses. Uh, and now with technology like Starlink and some of their competitors, uh, we see low cost uh, satellite internet being able to be delivered globally. And even um, uh, I think all new iPhones uh, ship with a, a, a satellite antenna in them for um, what started off as emergency texting, but Apple is now going to let us uh, do any kind of text messaging. So, so that's a great example of the cost decline, something that 25 years ago was um, a, a great idea, but ahead of its time. Um, it has matured and reached a point where it can be distributed to literally billions of, of iPhone users. Um, to give a sense of the magnitude of, of what you know the evolution of these innovation platforms is going to bring, um, we've we've done a, a study throughout history looking at uh, these general purpose technologies and how they've evolved over time and the economic impact that they've uh, brought about. And you really have to go back to the turn of the century in the 1900s to see a period of time where we saw this amount of uh, this number of technology platforms evolving together at the same time. This was the combination of the internal combustion engine that uh, really propelled the automobile, electricity, and the telephone. Um, so these, these, these really general purpose technologies that led to outsized economic growth during that period of the early 1900s. And we really haven't seen that number of innovation platforms evolving since then. Uh, until right now. Uh, we think this decade is the decade that is um, a unique period in history where we have these five innovation platforms. And you'll see on the right side of the screen, the underlying technologies that we think um, make up these platforms. Uh, to give you a sense, uh, artificial intelligence is a broad term. We think there, there are several enabling factors. One, cloud computing, everything you're seeing happening and really the next generation of the data center uh, combined with intelligent devices, uh, like you mentioned at the be beginning, actually, not just our, our phones and our laptops, but um, smart devices proliferating throughout our lives, both on the consumer and the enterprise side, uh, and the, the AI or the neural network brain that's being deployed, uh, trained in the cloud, deployed at the edge, uh, mix and match of both. Uh, these are the three things that we think are really coming together to power um, artificial intelligence. And you can see those other technologies for the other innovation platforms. Um, a, a great story behind this graphic is that we actually used GPT-4 to create it, uh, essentially helping us look through. Um, this is a study we've done in the past very manually and very intensively. Um, and, you know, let's say look through hundreds of pap research papers. Uh, we were able to look through thousands using GPT-4. Um, so it's, it's increasing our own research productivity and really bringing um, uh, some of these viewpoints that we've had for a long time to life in, in a new and interesting way. Yeah, I love um, to see that but it's just just to touch on that, right? It's it's you know it's yeah. so fascinating because you know we we're talking about it, but then you know it's actually being used in in practical fashion, as you mentioned, and you know just an example of that is you guys actually doing it not only for for your investment strategies, but literally doing it as part of the research too. So very very fascinating. Yeah, and it's it's something that um, has it's been amazing for me. I didn't really give my background at the beginning, but um, I uh, before I've been in Arc for about. Uh, three and a half years, uh, now the director of research focusing on all things AI, cloud computing, and, and digital assets. But uh, in my prior life, I was a software engineer and data, um, uh, software developer and data engineer. Um, so I spent a lot of time at the keyboard writing code um, and seeing the coding assistants, for example, that are out now, it is just amazing the, the productivity uplift that it can have. And um, uh, we have like half of our research team is now writing code to do their work when they weren't previously trained developers because these AI tools are enabling them to do that. Um, so it's, it's great to see it, not just um, what we're researching, but the tool that's also being used in research uh, kind of converging. Definitely. Um, so let's dive into AI then. Um, and this, I think, is, a, is an interesting slide to kind of set our bearings, which is 
the expectations for how quickly um, AI will evolve and reach a certain point. There's this very kind of nebulous term you may have heard called artificial general intelligence that, uh, to be honest, nobody has a clear definition on. There is no consensus. Um, so just know that whenever somebody's talking about AGI is that everybody means something a little bit different. Um, there is a specific forecasting site um, that has a defined definition for AGI that, again, is, is kind of an arbitrary um, goalpost, but it's a, a, a an artificial intelligence system that can both solve a variety of standardized tests, uh, basically ace them better than humans, uh, and as well can, can, um, can conduct kind of highly precise robotic movements. And the test that they give for that is constructing a, a model car that's very intricate. And I've looked through the instruction manual for this and I could not do it. So the their definition of uh, AGI is creating this system that is both highly intelligent and highly articulate, uh, both in the digital and the physical world. And it's a study that's been running for um, over the past five years, uh, asking AI experts when they think we will hit this point of AGI defined by the standardized test and the, and the robotic functionality. Um, and back in 2019, uh, and before they um, had predicted it would take 80 years. So sometime towards the end of this century, we would hit this system that was this performant. Um, we've been following artificial intelligence uh, since the firm was founded in 2014. So we've been familiar with companies like OpenAI, um, which was founded in 2015, I believe, uh, in part because of our thesis around Tesla and Elon being a um, co-founder of OpenAI. So we've seen them go from GPT-2, which is the first one people really paid attention to, to GPT-3. And, and at GPT-3 in particular, and this is the, the model that uh, really paved the way for ChatGPT. It's uh, what ChatGPT was ultimately based on. Um, when that came out, this prediction in one year went from 80 years down to 50 years. And then by the time that OpenAI launched ChatGPT, uh, the expectation went down to 18 years. When GPT-4 launched, it went down to eight years. So we've seen this massive compression in the amount of time that experts think it will take to reach this level of uh, uh, artificial intelligence capability. Um, if they're right now uh, and that it will take eight years, uh, we will see this capability at the end of this decade by 2030. If they continue to be wrong and progress continues to surprise on the upside, we could see it as early as 2026. Uh, so we think you know the truth is often somewhere in the middle. Um, but it just gives you a sense of how it really is an unprecedented um, pace of change that we're ha we're seeing right now, um, and the advancement of these systems. And you know, this whole presentation, I think, will bring that out um, in even in even greater detail um, through a few more examples. Um, so I mentioned ChatGPT. By now, everybody on this call is probably familiar with it. Um, Two years ago, when I would give these big ideas presentations about AI, we didn't have ChatGPT to reference, so people did not understand what uh, what these generative models can do. And I think um, it, it, it goes to show uh, how important creating an amazing user experience is um, to really bringing a technology uh, to, to bear to its potential, because um, this technology had existed. GPT-3 was out for uh, over a year before ChatGPT came out. And it really was putting that um, chat interface that was very accessible to everybody, uh, widely available, um, that, that, that kind of opened up people's uh, minds for the potential of generative AI. So uh, AI has been around for a long time. It's not a new field of study. And neural networks really came on the scene in deep learning in 2012. Uh, and it's easy to forget that kind of traditional predictive AI powers a lot of the web today. Uh, it powers Google search. It powers um, what's called deep learning recommender models. Uh, that power every feed that you see. So your feed on Instagram, your uh, feed on YouTube, what's recommending the next best video for you to watch on Netflix or the next best product for you to buy on Amazon. All of this is AI powered. Uh, and it's kind of sat importantly behind the scenes. The user doesn't really think that they're using AI. They're not really seeing it. And it's a, um, a professional software developer that's working with these models and building them into these products. Um, what ChatGPT did was really flip that on its head where you know you're interacting with AI. It's putting it right up against the front end user experience. And now you don't need to be a professional AI developer to use these tools. You just need to know natural language. And it knows many languages, which is really great. So um, that's the difference and why I think um, you see on this chart on the left that ChatGPT is the fastest application uh, in history to hit 100 million active users. It took just two months. It's now somewhere above 300 million active users. Um, really eclipsing what we saw from uh, some of the major social platforms like TikTok or Facebook or WeChat, for example. 
Um, and uh, it's no surprise to anybody following the financial markets that every company in the world has woken up to this and every boardroom is pressing their CEO and their CIO to now have a AI strategy. So there are some companies, um, those Web2 internet giants that have been talking about AI for some time, like Alphabet, Amazon, Meta, Microsoft, uh, that are now talking about it even more. They were ahead of the curve, which is why the market's really been rewarding them in this period of time. Uh, but now everyone is trying to scramble to figure out how to use this technology. Um, and, and what we think this means for enterprises uh, in particular, uh, and why we think there's such a, a large market potential for AI is that um, we see a dramatic increase in productivity that can be delivered to virtually all knowledge workers. Um, to give you a sense of what we mean by knowledge workers, this is people that work at a desk and on a keyboard all day, um, basically not physical labor. Um, and this is another aha moment, I think, from the um, kind of explosion of growth we've seen in generative AI, which is that uh, historically, people in the AI field thought that physical labor was going to be automated more quickly than knowledge work. So automating work in factories, automating the driving of uh, cars or trucks, all of this seemed like we were making kind of steady progress towards and that the fields of doctors and lawyers and accountants were uh, potentially unauditable, something unique to the human brain, or at least very far um, down the line. Uh, and um, models like uh, GPT-3 and GPT-4 really threw that out the window, where now all of a sudden it seems like uh, these knowledge work fields are actually going to be automated much more quickly uh, than the physical fields, uh, which, which is quite interesting. Um, and I mentioned it before, but software development is really our, our, our pinnacle example of this right now because it is delivering so much productivity gains. There's studies that show that um, AI models like um, that are used in products like GitHub Copilot, that's Microsoft's um, software development tool, um, help developers complete coding tasks two times as fast. Uh, and this is continuing to get better. Um, there's a, a trend now called uh, agentic models, which basically means they can not just write, um, you know, one file of code for you, but complete your entire coding project, build a website for you end to end that are models are just getting good enough to do now um, that could take this from a 2x developer to a 10x developer. Uh, and this is important in the context of thinking of a global labor shortage too, where software developers have been a, a, a constrained field for really the last uh, five to 10 years uh, that we now can make every developer that's employed in an enterprise uh, two times more productive today and potentially 10 times more productive in the future. Um, so we think this is going to lead to um, really an explosion of growth and a lot of things that it didn't make sense to build software around um, in the past economically, now viable to build um to build software to make things more efficient. Um, this generalizes across software development. That's another key component of generative AI is that these models are general. They are good at not just one task, but many different tasks. Uh, so similar studies have shown that consultants can be uh, 25 times, 25% uh, faster uh, and have higher uh, quality when completing tasks when using these models to assist in their day-to-day -day work. Um, it also importantly, and what you see on the rightmost chart here is, um, increases the quality of work from bottom performers more than top performers, which I think makes sense intuitively, but we think there's a potential to dramatically close the skill gap that you see where everybody in, in the workforce can be upskilled um, and it will help the most uh, actually people that are on the, the lower half of performance uh, if you rated um, all, all the global employees. Um, this is another way to look at that general capability. These are a, a litmus of a variety of um, standardized tests um, I'll point to one as an example, which is the uniform bar exam. This is the law exam in the United States. And uh, it's showing the the year on year model improvement. So GPT 3.5 to GPT 4. Uh, GPT 3.5 scored uh, a tenth bottom 10th percentile on this exam, meaning that it was worse than nine out of 10 people that took the test. Um, so totally failing. People thought there's no way this model will ever be good enough to do law. Um, now, just uh, a year later, GPT-4 scored a 90th percentile on that exam, so better than 9 out of 10 people that take it. Uh, all of a sudden, this model is now capable to be used in all kinds of workflows across uh, 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 an attorney's job. Uh, and it's actually, there are several AI startups that are working to do just that. One of the popular ones is called Harvey. So um, it, it, it's quite amazing that we're seeing these capabilities, and it's coming from um, a, a variety of things, including leveraging more and more compute to train bigger models. The, um, the interesting thing here is that we've learned that bigger models are more performant and 
to make bigger models, you need to feed them more data and use more training compute. Uh, that's why everybody is scrambling to buy GPUs from companies like NVIDIA uh, and gather as much data as they can from the public internet or um, employing um, even professionals to create net new content for their models. Uh, so there's a growing industry of companies like Scale AI that just raised at a greater than $10 billion valuation who um, scour the world to find professors in physics and have them write uh, papers to be used to train these models. Um, so there's really a, an explosion of content creation just to feed these models that's happening. Um, and again, across domains. Um, I mentioned cost declines when talking about kind of general purpose technologies. Uh, and in AI, we are seeing one of the most, uh, one of the steepest cost declines in history. Um, and this is an example of something that uh, the cost to produce written content has not really changed much throughout history. So this is going back over 100 years. The cost to write a thousand words, uh, so hiring a professional writer to, to write a blog for you, um, has ranged from 100 to $300 um, adjusted for inflation. Uh, and what we saw with GPT-4 is that cost fell from about $100 an hour to $0.16 cents, and being able to do that in a matter of seconds. Uh, and that gives you kind of median quality writing. Uh, and so this is an unprecedented thing. You can see this chart looks like very few charts in history. Um, but it also doesn't stop there because these models are improving so quickly. Um, less than a year later, Anthropic, which is another private company that competes with OpenAI, uh, produced a model that for a quarter of the cost can achieve uh, top 10% writing. Uh, so now you have higher quality at a lower cost, at a faster speed too, uh, that came out just uh, a few months after GPT-4. Um, and all of these things have continued since the slide was made. It's hard to keep up with um, the, the rate of change that's happening. Um, here's gonna, another way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I, sorry, Frank. I was just going to butt in and say, like, you know, even internally, we've done some training on AI. And I remember it was maybe, you know, I think about a year and a bit ago. And one of the, you know, when we were doing it, one of the, I guess complaints was that you know, in terms of writing and, and quality to kind of get humor and, and to really emphasize a point, a lot of people were struggling with. I know that even in the US there were, you know, in, in Hollywood, there were writer strikes about AI and these things. Uh, and I think there was a lot of people that are thinking, you know, it's, it's not really going to, the quality is not going to necessarily be there. And then you see in, in a very short amount of time, it just gets better and better. So it's really, really fascinating to see. Yeah, exactly. And it, and it reminds me of, um, like, if you look back for analogies in history, um, like how Microsoft came to dominate the personal computing um, era. Um, there's a podcast called Acquired that I recommend everybody listen to that goes through this in like four hours of detail. They, they do an amazing job. But um, Microsoft was creating the Windows operating system, and they wanted to kind of move from the operating system layer to the application layer. Um, and there was a, um, a, a leading software provider um, for creating spreadsheet software called Lotus123, I think. Um, and Microsoft was trying to figure out how to build a better spreadsheet. Um, but the Lotus software was really the best you could get in a um, terminal environment. So this is before we had kind of graphical users interfaces where you could drag windows around and use a mouse. Um, and uh, both firms had kind of looked at that and said, oh, it's not possible on today's hardware. Uh, and Lotus said, why would we develop for tomorrow's hardware when we have a great product today? And Microsoft, um, understanding the cost declines, uh, built Excel, knowing that it's not possible today, but in three or four years, it will be. Um, and, and I think what we're seeing now, um, the cost declines, and, and that was because of Moore's Law. Uh, it's a bit of a tangent, but Moore's Law suggests that um, the cost of um, computing hardware or silicon in particular falls in half every two years. We've measured the cost declines of AI as falling in half roughly every six months. Uh, so it's something that's happening at a rate of change, almost like you can think of it as four times faster yeah. than Moore's law. So what Microsoft waited four years to be possible could be possible in one year or less uh, with the rate of change of AI today. Um, so I think that's really important um, not to underestimate. It's what going back to that um, time to AGI chart suggests is that we've continually underestimated the pace of change here. Um, I will probably talk about it in a little bit, but the markets are very um, uh, taking a lot of bets on how quickly things will happen uh, for different companies. So we can go into that more company specific yep. uh, later on. Um, let's go. Um, let's go here. So a, a natural question from a asset manager after you're talking about kind of all of this wild potential for generative AI is um, 
uh, what uh, what market does this create and who does it disrupt? Um, and how much will businesses be willing to pay for the software? Um, right now, we actually think we're pretty under monetized. The coding assistants that make you two times more productive, for example, are, are only $30 a month. So you can imagine a software engineer that's making $100,000, $200,000 a year. You can you know, materially increase their productivity for $30 a month. That's crazy. Uh, it's, it's a no-brainer. And that's why I think Satya Nadella from Microsoft calls it a... Um, what's becoming a standard issue product that just every new developer gets this. Um, and I think, you know, that's why it is such a good um, first example of, of an AI use case. Um, we looked across, uh, we did a study looking across um, uh, kind of categories of enterprise software over time to see how much value they capture relative to the value that they create. So if you're making a hundred thousand dollar software engineer more productive um, kind of at the end state, how much value can you capture from that? Um, and there's a, uh, kind of a clustering around 10% historically and a spectrum that varies based on how commoditized that use case is. Um, so something that's very commoditized, it, but also drives a lot of productivity is email. Um, the companies cannot charge very much for email anymore because it is a open standard that is, uh, you know, basically totally commoditized. Uh, so it creates a lot of value, but it captures very little from it. And then something very differentiated like CrowdStrike cybersecurity platform that requires uh, leverages trillions of data points that they've been gathering over many years, uh, that captures a large amount of the value that it creates. Um, on average, we've seen about 10% value capture. So that's basically how we start to model this AI opportunity of the, uh, the vendors that can make end employees more productive may capture 10% of that value that they create. Um, and if you zoom out to what that means on a global economic scale, there's about a billion knowledge workers in the world, uh, and we pay them um, by 2030 a, an average of um, $30 trillion in wages. Um, so you can think that anybody that can make those knowledge workers more productive has a chance to capture 10% of that value on a $30 trillion base. So the, the pool of labor, and this is kind of that aha idea that knowledge work can be automated more quickly than physical work. Uh, there's a really a multi-trillion dollar market available to the software vendors uh, or the AI tools providers that go in and drive these productivity gains. Um, so we look at, you know, a range of possibilities because again, things are happening fast. It's, it's unprecedented in several ways. So there's a lot of uncertainty, but you see a sensitivity table on the left of, you know, what, um, what productivity uplift we actually see in the market, because there is still an adoption cycle behind this that takes time. You, you're not seeing a hundred percent deployment of software developers. In fact, if you wanted to, um, kind of give a sense of where that is. Microsoft last reported about 1.4 million uh, signups for GitHub Copilot. Um, they're probably somewhere between two to 3 million right now. And the global base of professional software developers is 25 million. Um, so even on the kind of home run use case, we're only about 10% penetrated. Uh, so there could still be kind of nine times more deployment just for that one use case of professional developers. Um, and that doesn't even get to include, you know, this concept of market creating innovations that actually expand the total addressable market meaningfully, where um, there's 25 million professional developers right now, but there's actually 100 million GitHub users. And there's uh, a, a large pool of people that have software developers working for them, like product managers that may actually start to develop software on their own. Or maybe I should use Arc as an example. Um, uh, investment researchers that are now becoming software developers and willing to pay for these tools um, because it makes our jobs uh, more productive when in the past it didn't make sense to hire a full-time software engineer for it. Um, so at a midpoint of a 4.5x productivity increase and 10% value capture, uh, we think you could see uh, $13 trillion in spend by 2030 on um, AI productivity. Uh, and importantly, we think that um, it accrues across a stack of, uh, of AI uh, solutions. So not just the top layer of the stack, these kind of end applications like a GitHub Copilot, and not just the bottom layer like the chip providers like NVIDIA, but, but many layers in between. Um, and that's really based on looking at the current uh, cloud computing stack where you have hardware providers, you have the clouds or infrastructure service providers. That's today, it's Amazon, Google, Microsoft as the largest. Uh, there's platform companies that make it really easy to develop applications or database vendors. These are kind of all the software tools you use to build applications. And then there's en those end applications. So it's kind of this multi-layered stack that I think value will accrue um, across. And what you're seeing right now, and it's natural for a new investment in a, in, a, in a stack like this, is 
all the investment and the accelerated growth is happening at the bottom of the stack because you need those foundational investments first before you can deliver these kind of end use cases at scale. So that's why you've seen so much acceleration and interest around NVIDIA's business, why it's now the largest company in the world by market cap. Uh, and you're seeing it start to flow up to the cloud providers. So Amazon, Google, Microsoft, all reported accelerations in their cloud over the last two quarters. Uh, and we're just starting to see it make its way into the platform layer and the application layer um, in, in different examples. And we think that um, really when you're, you're positioning investments or portfolios, and again, not investment advice, uh, the market has been uh, very emphasized towards these lower parts of the stack and is ignoring the top part, the higher parts of the stack right now. Um, so I think that's an, an interesting dynamic that um, should flip over time. Otherwise, all those kind of investments in the hardware down the stack don't really make a lot of sense if you can't make money off of uh, the chips that you're buying. Um, I don't know if there's a smooth way to pivot this, but we wanted to touch on digital assets. Um, so we'll just go there. And you can pull us back to AI or double down on digital assets, however you want, Akshay, in the uh, on the in the Q and A. But um, another core focus of Arc's research, um, one of the other innovation platforms, is digital assets. Um, and we've spent a lot of time focusing on Bitcoin in particular. So I'll walk through uh, some of our latest research there. It's I think particularly relevant with the um, Bitcoin ETFs launching in the U.S. finally being approved uh, this year. That we're seeing kind of. Um, more acceptance for what we believe is a new asset class and the doors for institutional investors um, in the US at least opening for the first time. Uh, and we think that's really important. Um, Bitcoin has been really a focus for ARC's research since 2014 when the firm was started. And Kathy is um, our, our portfolio manager is known for, and the founder of ARC, um, for being uh, one of the first active managers to get exposure to Bitcoin um, when it was trading at $250 uh, back in 2015. Um, and since then, um, like I said, we think this is uh, an example of a new asset class that has interesting properties and deserves to be compared against other traditional asset classes like gold, non-gold commodities, uh, bonds, stocks, emerging markets, etc. Uh, and, and that's because um, it offers a unique proposition of being a uh, non-government, so independent monetary system that's global by default and allows for peer-to-peer -peer transactions that are outside the purview or do not require traditional intermediaries like large central banks that we have today um, that can be uh, both a store of value and a hedge against local currency uh, devaluation. Um, when you look at what the adoption of this asset class has uh, done to the price of a token like Bitcoin, um, across many different time horizons of Bitcoin's life, uh, it has outperformed uh, generally across these other asset classes. Um, and I think uh, it's easy to look at that and say, okay, all of Bitcoin's growth is done. You know, it's appreciated, you know, so many thousands of percents, but I'll get into in a little bit why we think um, really the adoption story uh, for Bitcoin is just starting. Um, one of these things that we look at of, of kind of the institutional case and why um, more sophisticated institutional investors may want to get exposure to Bitcoin is because it is an uncorrelated asset. Um, it has relatively low correlation against these kind of other assets that I showed previously. Uh, so it actually can serve as a portfolio diversifier uh, and, and, and add a, um, a new element to a portfolio that, again, can be an a, a, low leak, a low correlation diversifier that has experienced high returns. And we think there's justification that um, those returns uh, should continue if adoption of the network continues. Um, if you do a efficient portfolio analysis, so you look at, uh, if I was building a portfolio of all of these asset classes um, and I was trying to maximize my risk adjusted returns, uh, which is measured by something called the Sharpe ratio, uh, what would a optimal portfolio over the last five years look like of Bitcoin, gold, real estate, stock bonds, et cetera? Um, and what you find when you're doing that is uh, an optimal allocation of Bitcoin over the last, um, this is uh, eight years, of 4.8% on average. So these are rolling five-year periods. This is past performance and not indicative of future returns. But if you were purely focused on the statistics and you didn't care about the fundamentals of the network at all. You just look at the properties of uh, how the asset has performed and you wanted to optimize for risk adjusted returns. Uh, that optimal allocation would be 4.8%. Um, and I think that's a lot higher than what 
um, a lot of asset managers would expect. And we don't think that um, everybody will go there overnight now that we have a Bitcoin ETF and, and Bitcoin is more widely available around the world, um, even outside an ETF. Uh, but we do think that as uh, Bitcoin becomes available to, say, financial advisors uh, in certain markets, they will put their clients, let's say, 1% or 2% in Bitcoin, depending on their risk tolerance. Um, and that is uh, an optimal exposure that's increased over time as the asset is still uh, continued to perform while also volatility has come down. It's still a highly volatile asset. So the strategy uses um, a monthly rebalancing to capture uh, some of that volatility um, uh, in this analysis. Um, the question then becomes, you know, what is, you know, I've been saying that it's early in the adoption cycle. What does it look like for Bitcoin? If we actually saw um, smart money allocate at this 4.8% average allocation or optimal allocation on average over the last um, eight years. Uh, and because Bitcoin has a, a fixed supply of 21 million, you can actually do some fairly simple arithmetic for every new dollar in needs to acquire Bitcoin from an existing holder. Uh, and how much that would increase the supply if we saw 4.8% of the world's global uh, investable asset base deployed into Bitcoin. So basically, if the world shifted to the optimal uh, portfolio allocation based on our study. Uh, and at that 4.8% average allocation, it would increase the price of Bitcoin by $550,000. Um, so that's you know a little bit less than a uh, 10x from where we are now um, at $57,000. Uh, so we think there's still quite a bit of growth uh, left to happen here. And you can see how, um, you know, even if there's a 1% allocation in the shorter term, uh, Bitcoin could more than double from where it is now. Um, and the most recent optimal portfolio in 2023 was an interesting year for a lot of uh, financial markets for varied reasons, but um, you could go much higher. Um, so this is kind of a, a different look at how we've analyzed the value and potential value appreciation in Bitcoin than what we've done in the past um, that we think is a good um, kind of secondary measure and also gauge of where we are in the adoption cycle. The other ways that we've looked at Bitcoin and come to similar price targets is uh, kind of stacking up the different use cases for Bitcoin. So Bitcoin as a digital gold, uh, which does make up the largest portion of uh, expected value for Bitcoin versus Bitcoin as a, um, uh, a, a currency devaluation hedge versus Bitcoin as a um, uh, actually use uh, for a day-to-day uh, -day transactional currency, um, which that's probably the farthest off in the future and the lowest part of our expected value. Uh, we think there's a tremendous amount that Bitcoin can deliver today purely as that um, kind of store of value asset. Um, so that's kind of in general, our, our latest theses and work on Bitcoin. Um, we've also um, over the last, let's say three, three to four years started to broaden out our research into um, the world of digital assets outside Bitcoin including work on smart contracting platforms like Ethereum and Solana. Um, you'll see much more of that coming out of ARC's crypto team over the next year or so. Um, and it, if you go to arc-invest.com and download the full Big Ideas decks, there's plenty of slides on that content as well. Um, but with that, I've talked through a lot of slides. I'm happy to uh, open up for some Q&A now. Awesome, Frank. Thank you so much for that. I think you look know, just straight off the bat. I think you know everything about the the AI piece, the Bitcoin piece. It's it's all you know definitely a lot of new and interesting information. So I know that our audience definitely has got a lot out of that. So thank you for sharing that, and myself also a lot of really interesting new ideas. Um. So yeah, let's open it up to Q and A. I think you know I've got some some questions. Uh, you know, based on what you're presenting on, that I'm happy to ask you about now. But if anyone in the in the audience has any questions, please feel free to ask them in the chat function as well as in the Q&A function, and we'll get to those. Um, okay, awesome. So, Frank, we talked a lot, you know, about, I guess, AI initially, and I wanted to talk a little bit more about it, um, you know, in terms of the markets. So, like, how have AI-focused equities performed in comparison to broader markets over the past few years? And have you, you know, has, has your team seen any notable trends or patterns or anything like that? I know you touched upon it slightly, but just, I guess, in the more broader market um, sort of term. Yeah, well, actually, the, that's a it's a good uh, clarification at the end of that question, because uh, the market has been kind of increasingly narrow in what it's rewarding versus what it's not, um, where we've seen um, kind of a lot of investment in what, what I kind of called that AI stack at the bottom layers. So companies like NVIDIA and the 
AI related hardware companies. So some of the server manufacturers like Supermicro and Dell are two examples that have seen really strong performance. Um, some of uh, NVIDIA's suppliers like TSM, Taiwan Semiconductor, which is the foundry that actually produces NVIDIA's chips. Um, and then that layer right above uh, the chip companies, which are the the, the cloud computing companies like um, Microsoft, Alphabet, and uh, Amazon have all have all done very, very well um, over the last two years. And that's what you've kind of seen the new classification of the Magnificent Seven taking over from uh, what we used to call FANG. And I don't know if there was something in between. <laughs> the acronyms are hard to keep track with, but okay. but that's what the market has been rewarding. And they're even saying MAG6 now because they want to kick Tesla out of it because uh, it had a rough start to the year um, that we think that will change. Um, uh, and what, you know, when we look at, you know, how this compares to relative periods in history, we look at kind of the concentration of the market. And if you look at the um, the number one stock by market cap relative to the 75th percentile stock uh, uh, globally. We are at the highest point of market concentration that we've been in since the Great Depression, um, where AT&T was the largest stock. So um, it's been a long time since we've seen a period like this in history. Uh, and I think that uh, what we expect is not a Great Depression collapse. The concentration actually increased because there were so few companies that were actually able to survive that. But um, but that the market will broaden out over time and recognize um, uh, some of these other companies outside of just the MAG-6, let's say. I would think Tesla is one example that maybe we'll go back to saying MAG-7, but companies higher up in this AI stack. I'll give you a few examples of companies that we think are interesting. Um, Palantir is one of them that is starting to see this impact to their business. They are a uh, best-in-class data platform that can um, integrate data across many enterprise systems, deploy automations on top of it, uh, make it very easy to build custom applications within a business, uh, and then also layer AI and generative AI on top of those applications. Uh, they're seeing really strong accelerations in their uh, commercial business where their US component of that is growing at, um, on an adjusted basis about 70% per year. Um, and that's really a tremendous acceleration. It was actually a, um, a, it's been impressive to us to see how quickly they've been able to leverage their, uh, their data platform uh, to um, add in these generative AI use cases. Um, some of the other companies in the private space, Databricks is a good example of a data, um, uh, another best in class data platform uh, that's been doing really well, rumored to be growing about 60% plus year on year. Um, that um, you don't see in the public markets right now because that innovation is happening in the private markets, but um, they will probably look to enter uh, the, the public markets in the not too distant future. So uh, that's another example of, of where we're seeing some accelerations. Uh, and then on the where the market isn't rewarding or what looks much more challenged is enterprise software broadly. Um, it's been a pretty difficult year um, for uh, enterprise software companies, particularly the most recent earnings season of the reports of Q1 earnings where um, a lot of companies that um, that had a rough 2023 as kind of really macro impacts, I would say, kind of outside of AI, where sales cycles were elongating, companies were pulling in IT budgets. That really happened throughout the year for um, really every enterprise software company. So including the giants, like um, I'm ignoring Microsoft because Microsoft has the whole AI stack really yep. to work with, but uh, companies like Salesforce and SAP, ServiceNow, et cetera, um, had a, a tough 22 and 23, uh, but Q4 was way better than expected. Um, and the thought was, okay, the macro environment has turned, everything's getting better. Uh, and then Q4 got unexpectedly worse again. And so that hurt a lot of software companies. Um, and now it's a question of one, who has the management that can weather kind of this macroeconomic uncertainty? And two, who has the innovation chops to really deploy um, AI and get it into the hands of their customers uh, and actually monetize uh, that value and over what time horizon that happens. And I think what the market's coming to terms with is that it's taking longer than expected um, to do this um, this development and the implementation and scaling uh, of these AI use cases. Great, thanks for that, Frank. And I think it's, yeah, it's very interesting because you know that's the what's kind of covering financial markets, that's what's covering, you know, different sectors in the markets to individual companies, obviously, that you mentioned. Now, if we take it, take it a little bit, when we're looking at not the markets, but what about investment strategies? You know, how are AI technologies being integrated into more traditional investment strategies? Uh, and, and, you know, from a, maybe an institutional level, and also, you know, what are retail investors looking at? Yeah, I'll give you a, I'll give you a few more examples just from Arc and how we've been changing. Um, not necessarily 
um, the way that we invest, but the tools that we use and how we use them to basically do what we do better. Um, and one of those is using the coding assistance where now our team can um, write software to build, um, like one example is building um, kind of, I, I used uh, one of Anthropic's models, Claude, to build a custom interactive dashboard um, with like one prompt. It was honestly amazing um, to compare uh, different foundation models to see which ones are performing better than others. Um, they come out so quickly. You need you need some software to help you uh, do that comparison. Um, but a few other tools that we use that we really like, one is called Aira, A-I-E-R-A, -E which is a earnings call platform that has really um, built AI into many different facets of their product where they use um, uh, new uh, text to or speech to text models to transcribe earnings calls that are happening in real time. Uh, tag them for sentiment. Uh, so if a statement's positive or negative, uh, and then also track the mentions of certain, certain topics. So how many times a company, a company is mentioning our artificial intelligence or public blockchains, you know, things that we care about. Um, that's kind of the basic thing, what they built their business on, but now they're doing automated summaries of earnings calls. So, you know, there's only so many hours in the day for our team to listen to earnings calls. And we follow, every company that we invest in plus their closest competitors, but there's a large breadth of companies that could have uh, interesting insights for us that we can now get glimpses of their reports using the automated summaries. Uh, and then they also, and this is something that retail investors can do too. Um, they have a plugin uh, for ChatGPT. So if you go to the GPT store within ChatGPT and type in ERA, A-I-E-R-A, um, you can actually ask questions of earnings calls um, and it will actually reference ERA's database uh, to answer right within your chat GPT window. Um, so I do this to basically, you know, check if I want to know um, like Intel, which is a company we don't invest in, but it, we're, it's very important for our space of, of you know, what are they talking, what, what did the company management say about gross margins last quarter and how are they going to change next quarter? Uh, and ERA will actually answer that question for you. Um, so it dramatically kind of speeds up this research workflow. And there's a few things related to that on uh, different kind of transcript platforms um, that are um, really making our jobs easier and more effective. Um, it's none of these things are perfect. So I'll give the disclaimer that we fact check and you need to fact check a lot of the information that comes out of these AI models because sometimes they are blatantly wrong uh, and they give errors. A lot of times they're right and they're getting better every day, but um, you do need to, to double check these things because they're not perfect yet. Perfect. Thanks for that, Frank. Um, now, you know, we, you at the start of the presentation, when you talked about the big ideas, um, you mentioned that obviously AI is one of them and it integrates, you know, with, with potentially with some of the other innovation platforms, but you also touched upon, you know, public blockchains, Bitcoin. So how do you see uh, AI and public blockchains intersecting? Are there any you know, benefits, challenges of using AI to, to enhance the, these technologies? Yeah, this is a great question um, because it's, it's a little bit more obscure than the convergence between, say, what I mentioned, artificial intelligence, robotics, and energy storage that creates kind of the autonomous vehicle opportunity. I think that one makes a lot of hence, sense and people be like, oh yeah, that totally, I, I get it. I get it. That's happening. Um, and it is that those cost declines that are making that happen at a faster pace, the, the cost to train AI models coming down four times faster than Moore's law is why Tesla is able to ship updates to their full self-driving stack much quicker uh, than, than they have been previously. Uh, but um, like, how does it apply to public blockchains and artificial intelligence? And I think there's a few things that we've seen. Um, one, really one of the first ones that we saw is how public blockchains can be used to incentivize a group of people using kind of crypto economic incentive incentivization mechanisms. So rewarding contributors that crowdsource a solution um, using tokens uh, that have some utility in the future uh, rather than uh, paying out dollars uh, can be a way to kind of bootstrap a network and create a, a kind of a unique product that is crowdsourced. Uh, and there's a, a, a company and a blockchain network called Numeri uh, that does this where they, um, and this also answers your previous question of how AI is being used for investing, but uh, they use um, a crypto token to incentivize a global network of data scientists to create um, AI models to predict um, how the stock market, stock market will trade. Uh, and they basically combine all of these crowdsourced models into a meta model that they use to tra trade a, um, a hedge fund that's delivered, um, at least last time I checked up on it, um, pretty solid returns over their history. Um, so that's one really interesting convergence where it's not kind of directly the technology is working together, but it's um, a blockchain technology being used to incentivize development on the AI side that is then used for investing uh, that I think is pretty unique. 
And then another one, which I think is a more, um, let's say, towards the end of this decade or longer time horizon uh, convergence is uh, the rise of, and we did a podcast on this, which uh, I would recommend anybody looking up and listening to if they want to go deeper on it, but the rise of AI agents, um, which we think will be more autonomous, um, basically drop in AI knowledge workers that can complete tasks for you end to end, where you may give an ambiguous task, like help me launch this new marketing campaign. Uh, and that agent will go operate around the internet um, in your environment, in the open internet to try and complete your task. Uh, and throughout the work that the agent's doing, there's times where they will need to actually spend money to get the job done. So maybe they need to generate an image. So they'll go and outsource image generation to a best in class image generation model or a freelance developer and outsource to a human. Uh, and there's a chance that a internet native AI agent will want to use an AI native digital currency. Uh, so Bitcoin becomes this um, giving AI agents the ability to hold a Bitcoin wallet and spend Bitcoin uh, can almost be a, a financial superpower for these AI agents where they can um, uh, interact using a global currency that's less encumbered than using a, a traditional um, a currency because uh, you can't open a bank account for an AI model yet. <laughs> so, so I think that's a, a very interesting idea that we think we could see uh, in the future. There's a a firm that develops the Lightning Network for Bitcoin called Lightning Labs that has created kind of initial proof of concept for this um, that um, uh, we we have them on our podcast to, to go in, in much more detail. But uh, that's a couple ways um, that they could be uh, um, converging beneficiaries. Uh, the new thing is how they could actually become competitive, uh, which is that uh, Bitcoin mining is very power intensive. It's basically turning electricity into um, uh, Bitcoin. Uh, and artificial intelligence is also very power intensive, where you're basically yeah. turning electricity into an AI model when you're training. Um, so we're seeing now uh, kind of this rising competition to get access to global uh, to power around the world uh, that we think will will intensify. Um, we've talked to a few Bitcoin mining companies and AI companies, and they're directly seeing this, that it's more competitive to get access to power now than it was a few years ago. Mark Zuckerberg has said in an interview that he thinks it's going to be the um, the largest constraint going forward. So we're not going to be constrained on how many chips we can get, but how much power we can actually provide to those chips. Um, so it really is an important issue. And you see certain companies like CoreWeave, um, which is a, um, a startup GPU cloud company that's trying to compete with Amazon, Google, and Microsoft by building a AI accelerator focused cloud from the ground up, making deals with Bitcoin mining companies to lease some of their power for an extended period of time. So, so this is already happening there. In some ways, competing for power, a constrained resource, but also collaborating to um, to sell power to the highest bidder. Yeah, and I think uh, you know those those comments, uh, you know, all about power. I think flows quite well with this next question. A little bit more about kind of risk and regulation. So you know, it obviously presents a lot of numerous opportunities. But what are some of the risks associated with you know investing in AI, either directly in the companies uh, through equities, you know, directly. Uh, you know, obviously in, in, in different in different sorts of technologies, but, you know, what are some of the risks associated with this? Yeah, um, there's there's risks with investing generally that pertain here, of course, um, you know, past gains are not, um, uh, past results are not uh, predictions of future results or representative of potential future results. At any time, a company could be, their business model could be upended by AI or enabled by it. So there, there's kind of this, you know, continual market risk um, the, especially I think it's heightened when things are changing so fast that it's hard to, to stay up to date with it. That's partially why ARC focuses on having a longer term time horizon. I think it's, uh, particularly in times of fast, fast change, it's almost easier to predict where the world's going to go in five years than where it's going to go in five months, uh, because things in the short term are changing, but they're changing kind of up and down on the same trajectory, which is more AI enabled automation democratized across the world that drives a lot of productivity. Um, so we set our eyes on that five to 10 year time horizon when we do our research and we do our investing. And I think that that helps a lot. Um, but um, in terms of regulation, I think that's an interesting one for how markets will evolve here, where you really do have this tremendous concentration of power right now amongst the best capitalized companies in the world, kind of these Internet tech giants that have a lot of control. Uh, and regulators that that know they need to do something or they think they need to do something um, to 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 uh, meter or at least monitor the rate of AI adoption. Um, and I think that for certain things, uh, regulators need to balance kind of being pro innovation and accepting that the laws that we already have apply or they may need to create new ones. Um, and, and an example for that 
you know, we've been seeing um, the president, uh, the president in the U.S. put out a um, kind of an AI um, executive order to to investigate and look into some of these things. They haven't made their way into law yet, but one of them was kind of um, ensuring that AI models aren't uh, biased in any way. So if you're using an AI model for your hiring practices, how do you make sure that the model isn't, bot- is, model isn't mo- uh, biased towards one type of worker or, or another? Uh, and I don't think we need a new law for that. We already have laws that say you can't discriminate in your hiring practices, and you just need to make sure the model is, is acting in accordance to that law in the implementation, and the company deploying that model is responsible for it. It's much harder to actually go to a company that's making a generalized AI model, especially an undercapitalized startup, and saying, mm-hmm. hey, uh, can you prove that if your model um, you know, three years down the road is used for hiring, it's not going to be biased? It's going to create these artificial barriers to entry that only entrench the power of the largest companies in the world that can pay every legal fee possible to, to battle test their model um, and would really disencourage um, innovation from, from smaller companies. So I hope we don't trend there, but that is a risk that would, um, I think, ultimately harm smaller companies and um, kind of entrench the moats of some of the largest companies in the world. Yeah, and look at it. And I think that's that's a really important point to touch on because you know with, with you know with regulation also comes risk. And I think for a lot of people, um, you know, investing whether directly or investing, uh, you know, with, in funds that have an emphasis on this, uh, with with anything, right? You know, some regulation can obviously disrupt that change with whatever progress you're having. So, I mean, as I said, right, this goes back to the risk and reward factor with just general investing. Yeah, um, and I'll um. I'll give you the counter example of where regulation helps for public blockchains. Cause I think in, in AI, we have a lot of the rules that make sense that, that can already govern how, you know, businesses should behave regardless of what technology they're using. I think for public blockchains, it's a great example, particularly in the U S of where um, digital assets don't cleanly fit into any existing regulation. And we really, we really do need new regulation and countries outside of the U S have been much more progressive on this. Um, that can help kind of make clear rules of the road for how companies can operate and engage with digital assets that can actually, when you have that regulation, bring more participants in rather than just make everyone operate in a gray area and and actually curtail growth. So um, that's another place where I actually think you have the opposite impact when you have increasing regulation is that um, more companies can participate in this than would otherwise. Definitely. Um, so Frank, I'm going to move over. We got a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, I know it's almost uh, 7:30 as well from from for us. Um, so we got a question from somebody who's asking: the USD 550,000 target is expected to reach over how many years? So I think they might have been referring to the presentation. Um, yeah, slides. yeah, I saw this question come in. Yeah, we um we haven't put a specific date on that uh, 550,000 price target. I think that was really. You know, if you see 4.8% adoption over whatever period of time or, or allocation, um, it suggests Bitcoin's price could increase by that much. I'd refer you to the 2023 Big Ideas presentation where we actually give a 2030 price target that's that kind of use case based price target um, that uh, is about, I, I want to say like $670,000. So it's a little bit more than this 550 example. Uh, and that we think is achievable by 2030 um, in our base case. Um, you've heard Kathy mention uh, over a million in our bull case in terms of price per Bitcoin. Uh, and there's a downside case in there as well. Um, so that uh, general 550 to 650 range we think is achievable by 2030. Perfect. Uh, also got another question over here asking which industries do you think will experience the most significant change due to AI adoption? Ah, good question. Um, I mean, the one industry that I've talked about a lot, or maybe it's a job function more than it is an industry, is software development, where I think the, the lives of every developer is going to be changed, and that will affect every company that uses technology, or maybe doesn't use technology today, but will in the future because they can build software so much uh, more cheaply. I think another example, when I'm just thinking of like job categories more than industries that are like at risk. Um, if you if you've seen the latest OpenAI presentation on GPT 4.0, um, they they really showcase this new model that will be coming out that has extremely human like uh, voice to voice communication um, that really is uncanny. How it's it's it has this kind of emotional behavior to it. You, you really couldn't tell you were speaking to a robot instead of a human. And I think it's going to dramatically change every call center and contact center around the world where. Right now, the average contact center experience is bad. <laughs> you wait on hold, you get somebody that um, doesn't you know, properly know every way to solve your problem, and you have the potential to basically deploy a 
um, an AI model in replace of or in augmentation to contact center workers that um, you never have to wait on hold again because it's a robot that's always ready to spin up to answer your questions. Uh, and it knows every single detail about every single product the customer offers and every single interaction that you've had with that company uh, and can completely um, solve your issue more end to end uh, in a much better way. And I think that's going to become the, the default way to operate um, customer service in the future and also can become a revenue driver for these companies that, you know, uh, there are people that probably want to change their seat on an airline and are willing to upgrade, but it's such a headache that they don't do it. Uh, you can make that much easier uh, now. Um, other places that I think are going to change, or maybe in the convergence example, are in um, uh, uh, the autonomous cases in driving, for example. Um, that's going to change trucking. It's going to change taxi networks. Um, and it's going to apply to food delivery services with drones and uh, package delivery, um, for example. And then in what we call multi-omic sequencing, which is really the ability to, um, at a better level, interpret our, our DNA and protein structures in our body to, instead of treat diseases, to cure diseases. And I think that is a, um, you know, one of Kathy's biggest ideas um, that our, our team um, uh, talks about that is going to really change an industry that's based right now on um, mitigating the impact of disease and not curing it. Um, so that will be a tremendous change. Amazing. Yeah, look, really interesting. And it, it's, you know, it's, it's going to be very fascinating to see what comes into play over the next few years. Um, but look, with that being said, uh, I wanted to thank everyone for joining us today on this webinar. If anyone has any further questions, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to us directly uh, for any further discussions. Um, Frank, it's been a pleasure having you with us. The insights have been incredibly valuable. I'm very sure that our audience has got a lot of uh, you know, information from your expertise. So really, really appreciate you taking the time to share your knowledge with us today. Yeah, happy to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Perfect. Thank you, everyone.